Kia ora, Alan. Uh, kia ora. Uh, <laughs> thank you very and much for joining me this morning so that we can record your reflections, your personal reflections on a most significant career that you've had uh, as an anaesthetist and as a fellow of our college. Well, thank you very much for doing this. It's really very kind. No, it's um, something we really, really need to do. So just to set the scene, I can't go through your uh, your impressive CV line by line by line. We'd probably be here till this time next week. Um, but just to set the scene, you arrived in New Zealand in 1979, sort of yeah. freshly minted from medical school. Two years out. Two years out. I had done two years as a junior doctor in uh, Zimbabwe, actually at that time still called Rhodesia, and at the very height of the guerrilla war that was being fought at that time. And so they were kind of exceptional years for a junior doctor to be involved in because we were very short of doctors and it was very uh, full on. Um, you know, I hear current junior doctors complain about having too much form filling. We really didn't have a lot of that. We had a lot of direct hands-on um, yeah. work as I think you would have had as well in South yes. Africa. Mm. Yes. It, it was a very interesting time. So, um, what, what do you remember most about that time of your life, growing up in Zimbabwe, as it is now, Rhodesia yes. then? Uh, well, it's a bit mixed. Uh, the, um, you know, my parents separated. They got divorced when I was just over nine. And uh, we moved around a lot. And it was uh, from that age upwards, I was brought up by my mother. And we were really moderately hard up by the standards of um, of our sector of the population. <laughs> yeah. It's easy to lose sight of the fact that, that we were, you know, um, the core thing is I was able to go to a good public school and get a good education, which uh, yeah. is an extraordinary privilege. And, uh, but then as we moved through to the latter years and were involved in this very distressing war, uh, it was quite traumatizing. So uh, we, we left, uh, very pleased to leave and to be able to leave and um, didn't go back for quite a long time actually because it was a huge conflict in which people from both sides were dying. You know, more than 20,000 people died in that war and uh, there were bombs going off. Uh, we had several times when we were called in on a Saturday because a bomb had gone off in a supermarket and it was all hands to help with, uh, with the 50, 60, 70 people that had badly burnt and injured and things like that. So it was uh, a, a quite amazing to get to New Zealand, a little peaceful country where things actually were functioning and we worked hard here, but it wasn't the same. It was sort of within reason. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I believe you're learning to rail. Well, I have been trying very hard. Yes, we've done, uh, Sally and I have uh, tried, and we've done various courses, including now two first-year courses at AUT, which were excellent. Right. And so I think we've got that basic level that lets you function uh, for formal occasions, for example, for right. periphery and things like that, and uh, understand what's being said on the news, which is now yeah. quite a lot. You know, I think the New Zealand language is in transition. We are adopting so many te reo words uh, that it's going to become in the next 10 or 15 years some degree, to some degree a hybrid language mm -hmm. and, and we'll, we'll need to start having dictionaries of how to speak New Zealand. <laughs> but it is important and one of the intriguing things to me as an anaesthetist is that we are somewhat protected from the health and other problems faced by the population in their homes and so particularly Maori but any but, but many people in this country actually are relatively poor mm -hmm. I mean coming from Africa that I think it's a relative poverty mm -hmm. but it's still real yeah. and we tend to see patients in the hospital that have sort of been brought in sort of spruced up and got ready yeah, for us you know up, yeah. and also in a very safe environment we, we're not uh, having and I think um, we may not be as, as aware of equity issues and access issues and things of like that as, as some other groups of doctors, particularly general practitioners, but uh, others. 
And it's been, I think, uh, quite interesting to come to terms with. I've been quite proud of our college, actually, in the extent that the last two or three presidents, including yourself, have advanced those courses uh, really, very well. Yes, well, it's, it's certainly been a focus for me. And it, COVID, of course, has made it difficult. Uh, yeah. Because anesthesia was not seen as an, any kind of academic it kind wasn't. of... wasn't. Yeah. I mean, it's the famous story about Oxford when... Uh, you know, uh, Lord Nuffield wanted to donate a chair there, and he was donating three, and then he said, oh, I've decided to donate a fourth one, which will be anesthesia. And Oxford said, oh, well, thank you, we'll just take the three, we don't need <laughs> anesthesia. And he said, well, actually, maybe none would be the right number. <laughs> and, and that's how the Nuffield chair was first started at Oxford. Gosh. Yeah, very definitely a sense that this isn't a genuine uh, academic. Uh, whereas now, if you look at the situation, you know, with the people across Australia and New Zealand and with the college's commitment to research, which has been fantastic, we have, I think, you know, a number, Paul Miles, Kate Leslie, uh, several people in Auckland, uh, um, uh, Jamie Slay in Waikato. We have really got a very strong cadre of, of well-respected researchers. Yeah, it's, it's great to see, really, because you must have faced significant barriers yourself to... Yes, well, one of the funny things was that we anesthesiology wasn't recognised for PhDs so at the university, so uh, you had to do them in pharmacology or something like that. So I applied for them to be uh, regi to register it, and they said, well, you can't do that because you've never done it. I said, well, that's a chicken leg answer. Anyway, it was quite funny. And uh, just through persistence, we got them to register. And I think there's probably been 30 PhDs through the department now. I'd have to check the number, but yeah. I know that I've been involved with about 15. So uh, with other people that have been doing it, uh, I think uh, it's been... Uh, and that's actually, for the size of the department, very good. So, well, I, I mean, academic is a broadly based thing. And... I think one of the things that we are very strong on is education, which is a key part of it and very important. I don't think everybody should do research. It's always been my position that only people who want to do it and like doing it, and I think you need a certain mindset to do it. You need a doubting mindset that looks at the received wisdom and says, I wonder if that's true. Yes. Uh, and you've got to just want to do it. But I think supporting research is a different thing and we should support it because I can tell you that in my more general role, say in the university, I've seen what other disciplines do, such as you know medicine, surgery, uh, pediatrics, in particular pediatrics, very strong academically. Yeah. And you know, the majority of those specialties, they're very actively involved, a lot of people very actively involved in research and often doing very good research. And it is part of advancing the specialty. It is part of the reputation of the specialty. But most particularly, it is about providing better care for patients. Mm -hmm. And I think continuing to keep that as a priority, continuing to, uh, you know, the support that the college gives, but also from a collegial point of view, many of the studies that we've done and I've been involved with would only be possible with the support of the clinical people. And you don't need to do research, but supporting other people to research is a fantastic contribution. So I'd like to thank people for that because I've had a fantastic amount of that, but it's so important. So quality and safety, talking about that now. Um, 1997, tell us about medical manslaughter. What was the background to that and why you wanted to change that law? Well, as a young um, consultant at Green Lane, you know, um, there, was, there was first of all a case in the West Coast of an Australian anaesthetist coming over and having a child die on the first day of working. And um, he was found, charged and found guilty of, uh, so what happened was a, 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 a misunderstanding of the, the flow meters and he gave a hypoxic mixture, yeah. uh, I think with carbon dioxide actually. Uh, and um, the, uh, he, w he was charged and convicted, uh, convicted of manslaughter, but with no particular penalty. I can't remember. There may have been a fine. He went back to Australia where they heard his case uh, at the Medical Council, I think, in Queensland, and, and said he had nothing to answer for and really commented on how inappropriate the conviction was. Yeah. But that seemed like 
uh, nothing more than a little red flag. But then uh, a Sri Lankan doctor, who I'll call Dr. Y, um, gave a wrong drug in an emergency. Now, he'd come over to New Zealand. Uh, he was allegedly working under oversight at Tikawiti. And um, he ended up uh, with a patient at the end of a, a gallbladder operation, getting biting down on the tube, and he intended to give doxapram, but gave dopamine as an undiluted ampule because someone had swapped ampules in a in the drug drawer. And it was his own honesty that led to the charges of manslaughter. The police, of course, subpoenaed the report he'd done in confidence to the Anesthesia Mortality Committee, and uh, he was convicted and discharged without, without penalty. But, you know, being convicted of a crime, manslaughter, is, is um, a pretty big deal. And I was very distressed by it because I had a couple of drug errors myself that were without consequence, but which worried me. And it really struck me that the one thing you need for a manslaughter charge is dead patients. And in cardiac anesthesia, you do have a mortality rate. Yeah. And so uh, I got really worried and thought, well, I'm either going to have to stop doing anesthesia or I'm going to have to move country. And then it occurred to me the third option was to see if we could change the law. <laughs> so, of course, we, we established the New Zealand Medical Law Reform Group, and, and that included Leona Wilson and Bruce Corkle and Ross Blair, uh, as key as key people. And Ross was a surgeon? Yes, he was surgeon, a thoracic surgeon from Hamilton. Uh, and uh, in the end, he and I became co-chairs of it. And you succeeded? Well, it, 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 we did, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we did a study where we surveyed New Zealand anaesthetists and um, a, uh, the vast majority 89% admitted to having made a drug error, which is important yeah. because if everybody's doing it, then the problem is systematic rather than bad people. But my friend David Morris is a surgeon. I showed it to him before we published it. He said, you can't publish this. This is dreadful stuff. You, this will be, you, can't, you just can't publish it. And I said, well, we are going to. And he said, well, if you do, you're going to have to do something about it. You can't just publish it and then walk away from it. You know? And I still remember that conversation. Yeah. And of course, part of what we did in the advocacy was to say that, that we're not saying that safety doesn't matter. We're saying that the criminal law is not the way to advance it. And so basically, um, that just led me getting more and more interested in, in the wider issue and then starting to do increasingly research projects to try and address some of these issues. Hmm. And that law change, do you think it's served our community well and anaesthetists and patients alike? Oh, for sure. Uh, the criminal law doesn't serve patients well. Uh, it's terrible. What people don't get is the majority of times the result is a, non, is a not guilty finding, uh, it, at the, by, the, by which time people have been through a terribly difficult time on both sides. And patients find that inexplicable because they will have heard that the care wasn't perfect. They will have heard that there were things wrong with the care, yeah. but the law will have found for various, often technical reasons, that they don't amount to the threshold for, for manslaughter, even under the old standard. Yeah. And so, uh, and then if they do get a guilty finding, they might get some satisfaction out of that, but they don't actually get um, uh, financial compensation. Mm -hmm. And generally, it doesn't lead to an improvement in practice. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just a very poor way of dealing with improving healthcare. And I think what we do in New Zealand is, is not perfect yet, but it's a lot better because we have the Health and Disability Commissioner that will look at things. We've got um, proactive work by, by the, well, the Quality Safety Commission doesn't do very much for anesthesia, but it does more generally in healthcare. Yeah. And of course, um, new organizations like the College and the Society are very engaged in trying to address these problems. And so you have a much more efficient way of trying to produce safer care uh, the, the law is not, never designed for that. It was designed for people who wake up and say, you know what, today I'm going to go and rob a store with a gun. <laughs> That's what it's designed for. Yes. It's not yes. designed for us. No. So now that it's been removed, do you think anesthetists are accountable enough? So technically it hasn't been removed. The, what happened was that, the, that we used to have a civil standard of negligence, uh, just a failure to use reasonable knowledge, skill and care, what is now required is a major departure. 
In practice, since that change, and by the way, it didn't only apply to anaesthetists or even to medicine. It applied, for example, to farmers who are using dangerous equipment. Uh, and one of the most recent cases involved a farmer in the South Island with allowing the child to use a quad bike. Yeah. And that actually was found not guilty under the new standard, where it may have been. And more recently, police officers were in a case where, again, under the old standard, they might have been found guilty but under the new standard, they were not. Uh, so I think um, in practice, I think the, you would need to be quite negligent now in New Zealand to face, to be convicted. You might still be charged, but the police, the police haven't been charging people, and I think it is very much because of that change. Mm -hmm. But the other systems do still operate. The, uh, and I see no evidence that the practice hasn't, that it's been anything but good. Sometimes it, when, when the Health and Disability Commissioner makes an adverse finding on anaesthetists, people understandably become very upset. But actually, it's kind of important that there is something that will do that because I think one of the things that led to the manslaughter charges was patients not having anywhere else to go. Yeah. And believe me, that's just so much worse. And Alan, of course, you've been hugely influential, not just in New Zealand and Australia, but further abroad as well. So tell us about the World Federation of Societies. <laughs> you know, it's an amazing organization. I, um, the surgeons don't have an equivalent. Uh, a body that represents anaesthesia globally, or seeks to. Mm. And it is, of course, uh, built around the idea that it's uh, representative of societies of anaesthesia. It actually struggles a little to know how to cope with our part of the world where we have strong colleges as well as societies, and also in England. Uh, the, uh, but its primary function, I think, is advancing standards in low-income parts of the world where the risk of anesthesia may be a hundred or even a thousand times higher than it is in New Zealand, mm -hmm. and where anesthesia may be given not by specialist anesthetists or anesthesiologists, but by people with varying degrees of training. Now, some nurse anaesthetists are well trained and do an excellent job, but many of the people doing this are not nurse anaesthetists. Mm -hmm. They are technical people, often with maybe a year of training, sometimes less. Uh, and they're not only not equivalently trained, but they uh, don't have much influence. So, and they don't have much in the way of resource. And so they're trying to do dangerous, difficult things for patients in a very disadvantaged circumstance. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, it's interesting, I took a picture of a operating room in the anesthesia trolley in a small Vietnamese, rural Vietnamese hospital, and there's about three drug ampules on it. Actually, medication safety is not their problem. <laughs> the, the problem is yeah. medications, <laughs> getting them in the first place, yeah. and all the other things at that time, you know. so. That sort of led to the pulse oximetry stuff and uh, trying to do something about that. I think um, over the recent years, the WFSA has grown in strength and has become important for high-level anesthesia, uh, high-income anesthesia areas as well, more important because it's now got a voice at the WHO. Uh, and I think a lot of that was to do with making the organization more professional, um, bringing in a CEO. Uh, Julian Gorsmith, uh, and uh, now I think the, uh, the the secretariat has gone from when we started there one uh, uh, one person doing everything. I think it's about seven or eight people now, or maybe more, and uh, that they're all now they're raising money for different projects which are being run, and and it's uh, it's remarkable. It's certainly the people who contribute do so free. They travel at either sometimes their own expense, sometimes economy class, sometimes it's paid for by WFSA. They stay in basic hotels. It's not a, a junket. It's a people trying to uh, advance the standard yes. of anesthesia. Yes. And I think it's well worth supporting. And I know um, the great news about that is that uh, Wayne Morris 
is the in, will be the incoming. He is the one of the two presidents, and he will be the president of the WFSA. Oh, no, it's amazing. And it's it? a fantastic uh, uh, appointment. He has been, he has really walked the walk. He has done a huge amount on the ground training and advancing these standards, and he will be and is a great member of that uh, of that group. Mm. Uh, we've we've done well. Ellen, uh, the, you know, the sort of standard kind of question. What life experiences influenced you and became principles, guiding principles? I was having a conversation about principles versus virtues. Uh, I probably tend to, the, the, basically the language of virtue, virtue ethics rather that, because there's always, the trouble with principles is that they sound inviolate. You know, this is a principle, you always have to yeah. do it. Whereas the idea that something is a virtue is this is something that has got value, if you like. And, um, oh, well, I mean, <laughs> it's hard to say. I mean, you learn as you go and you make mistakes and you think, but not do that again. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think as far as healthcare and medicine is concerned, I am just increasingly convinced that having the patient as the central concern mm -hmm. and doing what is correct for the patient and or acting in the interest of the patient is a, unquestionably the right thing and interestingly the best thing for you yeah. if you, it, it always works out better for you if you make that the priority yeah. um, um, you know it's easy to talk about these things are uh, uh, one I've, you know you reflect on all the things you've done wrong and all the mistakes you've made and, and the imperf no question, lots of them. And I think you learn as you go and just trying to, to do that, to recognize when you get things wrong and trying to carry on, uh, but learning from those experiences seems to be worthwhile. Um, and, and you know, I will say this, but it's sort of said with a very careful caveat that I'm not making any personal claims here, but I do think honesty is important. And uh, again, it, it, it seldom doesn't work out well just to stick to the truth. Oh, that's true, <laughs> very true. So what are you most proud of? <laughs> <laughs> of all this long list. Oh no! Things. Look, it's not. Uh, you know, I. It's all been about lots of people working together and about happenstance, really. Uh, so, but I am proud of the specialty. Uh, to put this in, ref when I did decide to do anaesthesia rather than surgery, I think there was a sense at that time that it was a second best specialty, which I didn't think, but there was a sense of that, and. I think the advance that's been made in this part of the world through so many people, including yourself, and just including so, it just the list would be too long to, to go through, and it's, it's both through the high standard of clinical practice that is that one sees around one, the excellence in teaching and research that goes on, and of course the uh, very strong uh, college and the societies in both the trade New Zealand and uh, New Zealand society and very much so. Uh, we have lifted the specialty to one which has fantastic standing, well respected by government, very influential, very patient focused, with a pedagogy that's very sound, an approach to training that is not self-serving but is sound. Uh, uh, I'm very proud of that. Uh, just to be part of the specialty is something that I feel really very privileged and proud of. Uh, I oh, couldn't agree more. Well, thank you very much for this interview and for all that you've done for the specialty and continue to do for us. Well, thank you for doing this, but also thank you to everybody that has been so helpful to me in my life. It's been just, uh, when I look back on it, it's just, you can't really convey the level of appreciation that, that I feel. Thank you, Alan. Kia ora. Kia ora.